So I've gotten used to give this talk uh, to an audience of astrophysicists, uh, sort of extol the virtues of using artificial intelligence, machine learning in, in our research. And so now I have the, the inverse problem. So I now want to convince you guys that actually astrophysics is a really cool area of application for machine learning. I think it's actually perfect for the name of this meeting, which is the Applied ML Days. I, I think astrophysics data is a really awesome place to try out the latest that's coming out of computer science research, in particular, the latest in AI. I'm going to start my talk with this image here uh, that I took from a plane a couple months ago to illustrate the fundamental problem that we have in astrophysics that makes uh, understanding the universe even more difficult than other areas of science. And that is, we have a fixed view of the universe. So imagine if I asked you to understand the US economy or the US political system from this one image of Newark Airport that I took. It'd be quite difficult. You'd, you'd want some more data, you'd want things in motion, you want better resolution, and maybe you even run around experiments. And of course, in the real world, you can do that. In astrophysics, we can't. So we only have one view, we can't see time elapse. The characteristic time scale of a galaxy is 100 million years or so. And you have limited resolution. You have limited wavelengths. Uh, there's also these annoying features that sometimes block your view. Here there are clouds in the universe. There are other things that obscure your view. And so it becomes really difficult to try and piece together the fundamental mechanisms that make these systems work. Another problem we have in astrophysics is that we, we are practically addicted to just running regression tasks. I mean, if you go to a lot of astrophysics meetings these days, especially on galaxy evolution, which is uh, an area I work in, you, you essentially you fit lines, you fit models to data points. And actually, uh, in many cases, the free parameters in the model exceed uh, by far the number of independent data points. And so I, I recently I've gotten into more and more yelling uh, matches at these meetings about um, overfitting, which, of course, all you guys are familiar with, but astrophysicists by a good fraction are not. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can use machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the kind of tools that you guys work on to help us better understand the universe. So when you go to astronomy meetings, the hot word right now is big data. And uh, this, of course, of course, actually in astronomy, this has had a long tradition of collaboration with uh, computer science. This goes back to um, uh, Alex Saleh and um, Jim Gray building the database for what is known now as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So when you go to astronomy meetings, it's like, yeah, we're going to have all this big data. This telescope that I'm showing you here uh, is called the LSST, the Large Synoptic Sky Telescope. It's going to image a third of the sky. Uh, two-thirds of the sky, sorry, every three, di uh, every three nights or so, and it's going to generate 15 terabytes of data per night. And how are we ever going to analyze that? And then you go to these meetings and people have cheesy slides like this, it's going to be a data tsunami, and how are we ever going to deal with it? And, and the answer is sort of, oh, we're going to use machine learning, right? So as if it was this magic black box that was just going to help us deal with large data volumes. So I'm not going to talk about that because I think that that's a different problem and one that I'm less interested in. I'm more interested in how machine learning, artificial intelligence can aid us in understanding the data. Better analyze the data, better understand the data. And I'm going to give you three examples from a project that we started in collaboration with computer scientists at ETH Zurich. Uh, we call this project space.ml. And the idea is to really have uh, ready-to-go machine learning tools that we adapt from, again, the kind of things that you guys do, uh, and, and make them available to the astrophysics community. So I'm going to tell you about three projects. And the first one uh, addresses a fundamental problem we have in astrophysics, which is that we actually have a really crappy view of the uni universe. If, never mind the fact that we can never th see things change. We actually have really bad measurement devices. So the fuzzy thing with noise that you see here, this is a galaxy, and this is potentially a very interesting galaxy which could teach us physics, but we're looking through a telescope on the ground. Uh, it's actually not even in that great a location, it's in New Mexico, 
and it's a 60 second exposure. So there isn't actually that much in terms of features that I can really analyze here and get to grips with. So if I had, I try to calculate this a 10,000, a factor of 10,000 or so more money, I could take a picture like this because this was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so you can obviously see this, this image contains far more information and hopefully far more physical understanding than the previous image. The problem is it costs something like 10,000 more than the, pre the, the previous image. So we, we were thinking about how to extract more information from existing images, and so of course we used a GAN. And so I don't need to explain what a GAN is to you, to the astrophysicists, uh, I still do. And all we did was we, we made adversarial pairs out of original data and then artificially degraded data to uh, undo, at least in part, the degradation process. And this worked remarkably well. So here's an image of a galaxy, and it has some features, a star-forming region, and spiral arms. It, it looks quite nice. So we, we artificially degraded it. So clearly, this image is worse, or to think of it another way, cheaper to take. And then we used a state-of-the-art deconvolution, which of course doesn't recover all that much more because there's a fundamental limit uh, to what you can recover with a deconvolution. You, you run against uh, Nyquist sampling. And then we train the GAN with these adversarial pairs, the original and the degraded, and we undo the noise and we undo the blurring that we applied, and we get this back. Which of course is not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better than the original degraded. Now, the skeptics will come back and say, oh, well, you have to be really careful uh, here. You're just amplifying noise. The, some of these structures aren't real. And that's all true. But that image, the GAN recovered image, is actually more useful for science than the original degraded one, as long as you use these images in some sort of aggregate. And that means that the survey of the sky that maybe cost $100 million now can do an awful lot more science by doing something as simple as training a GAN overnight and applying it to your images. So another problem that we encounter, this is now the, the second project, another problem that we encounter a lot in something that I study uh, with great interest, which is supermassive black holes. Uh, every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center, and when that black hole starts feeding, that black hole starts to shine, and we call it a quasar. And so this is my oddest illustration of what would happen if that quasar in this galaxy would turn on. So now it becomes much more difficult to study the galaxy in which the black hole lives, but also because the galaxy is still there, it makes it difficult to study the light of the quasar. So we really wanted to separate galaxy light and quasar light, and so of course what we did is we used a GAN again. So here's a more realistic version of what that looks like. So there you can see the galaxy and you can see the, the point source from the quasar. Uh, you can see the diffraction spikes. You can see all the, the artifacts of the telescope that was used to make this image. So we trained again, and I, actually this is a project led by Dominic Stark, who is here, and so you should go talk to him. Uh, we simply made adversarial pairs where we took an original image of a galaxy, we added a fake AGN, a fake uh, black hole, and then train the GAN to optimally uh, remove the point source of the added black hole and give us back the galaxy and the black hole separately. So we did this and we compared it to the state-of-the-art parametric fitting tool, and it works really, really well. And in fact, it works far better than the state-of-the-art tool, the parametric fitting tool, in the regime where the quasar is very bright compared to the host galaxy, which is, of course, the most interesting ones. These are literally the brightest things in the universe. And now we have a better view on them. We did a whole bunch of tests that actually show that the GAN is not only better at recovering the underlying galaxy and the quasar itself, it's also far more stable. These parametric fitting tools that astronomers really consider state-of-the-art are incredibly sensitive. They're incredibly limited by the knowledge of the details of the telescope. They're also incredibly limited by the model of the underlying galaxy. And so to demonstrate that uh, our point source subtracting GAN is far more um, uh, far more flexible, we did things like just changing the shape of the point source doesn't really care. We also address the question of, don't you need a really, really good training set in order to do this adequately? And the answer is no, because we can train on images of cats and dogs, and it still does a reasonably good job. So that gives you some confidence that when you do one of these subtractions that you get a sensible result, 
even though you didn't have exactly the kinds of galaxies uh, that quasars live in in your training set. It's also superior at recovering the detailed features in the host galaxies compared to the state-of-the-art fitting tool. Now, you guys are not surprised by this. Of course, it's better. Uh, but I think um, pushing these kinds of tools out to skeptical uh, astrophysicists, uh, that's going to be, I think, quite a challenge. So let me now, in my final minutes, tell you about the third uh, project, the third approach that we're taking with SpaceML right now that I think is going to be really, really cool, especially in astrophysics. So I'm showing you an image of a spiral galaxy again. And I would love to understand how this galaxy changes. I want to know what it looks like 10 million years from now, 100 million years from now, a billion years from now. But e even with really good funding from SNF, I'm not going to be around for long enough to see that happen. So we need new tools to evolve galaxies, to test our hypotheses for the evolution of galaxies using the data. So what we do right now is we either you know, overfit models to the data, or we run simulations where we say, right, if physics works like this, here, here are my equations and here are the constants and whatever for the, describing the laws for star formation and black hole growth and all these things, uh, let me put that into an n-body simulation and see what happens. But of course, that presumes that the physics I put in is the correct physics, which I never know, right? And then I can only compare to reality. What I want to do is I want to train machine learning systems that let me just take the data and then manipulate the data to form model these processes, to have a completely data-driven approach to astrophysics. So this is what we did, and we started with an autoencoder architecture, and this is work led by Dennis Torp, who's also here, and you should also talk to him. So we used an, uh, an autoencoder structure to abstract images of galaxies and manipulate them in latent space. So what this looks like, it looks like something like this. So here are two galaxies, and actually sort of two, two archetypical types of galaxies. The one on the left is a spiral galaxy, like our Milky Way. The one on the right is an elliptical galaxy. It's a very different type of galaxy, but also very common. And so we, we, we encoded these two galaxies and then just did a linear combination in latent space to evolve these galaxies from state one to state two. So when I saw this, this, this really this blew my mind because it opened the door to exploring how galaxies change over several billion years. So several billion years between these two states, uh, but in a, in, a, in a using an approach that did not make any assumptions about what was going to happen. No simulations, no code, no constants that were just fixed by I don't know lore. Uh, this is purely data driven. Now, the problem is this linear interpolation in, in latent space is basically meaningless, right? Because this latent space is enormous, and I can take all these different paths through it, and I actually don't know which one has any kind of meaning. So, what do we do? We try and abstract particular physical properties that we think are relevant to one part of the latent space and remove the information from the other part of the latent space. And so, uh, we can do a completely data-driven transformation such as changing the age on the human face, or doing something that's kind of equivalent, changing the star formation rate in the galaxy in a data-driven way, and in a way that is independent of all the other parameters that may or may not be relevant. And so now, I can, in a completely data-driven way, mess around with my galaxies and explore what would happen. So what I'm going to show you now is uh, images. This, this is a real galaxy. Um, the resolution isn't that high because actually the, the neural network system that we're using uh, doesn't take such high resolution, beautiful Hubble images yet. Uh, but what we're going to do is I'm going to do two things to this galaxy that, that could never happen in isolation in reality. I'm going to do one thing first. I'm going to change the star formation rate, the rate at which stars are born in this galaxy. I'm just going to change it in the latent space to see what would happen. So this is not a simulation. This is not... Uh, something that I just made up. This is a purely data-driven change of this galaxy. And I can do a similar thing. I can change the structure, the configuration of the orbits of the stars in this galaxy by changing its so-called bulge-to-disk ratio and transform the galaxy that way. So now I have these knobs, like uh, these fader knobs that I can change 
to forward model and test hypotheses in astrophysics on systems that I could never see change by themselves. And it doesn't quite work yet, but I'm really optimistic that this is the way we're going to be doing astrophysics in the 2020s. So I'm going to put up my final slide and just uh, hopefully impress on you that what you guys are doing is going to be really cool for science and in particular for astrophysics. Thank you. <laughs>